and things, and specifically how it means to business. And we'll talk about what the difference is there. But um, as Tom said, uh, my name's Jim. I'm a senior consultant here. I mainly live in the .NET space. I'm also really concentrated in the JavaScript world, um, so a lot of web, <laughs> node, front end, that kind of stuff. And then mobile development, uh, Cordova and whatever. And we'll talk about a, a use case for that here, too. So um, Internet of Things. Some of you might have heard the buzzword. Um, today, we're going to talk about what it really is and how it applies to um, the people in this room. Um, and then we'll talk about data collection and all the data that we get off of these, these things that we're going to we're going to go through. Um, and then things to consider about that data collection. And uh, I'll get into a real world world example of uh, some work that we did, a project that we did for a client here on their IoT project and what it meant for them. Um, and then we'll have a little Q and A. If there are any questions, if you have questions during, you can certainly type in. But if you want to hold it till the end, there, that's that's fine too. Um, so to dive right in, the question is, and it really depends on the familiarity, but what is this, this term that we keep hearing called the Internet of Things? Um, the, the key form here is that it consists of things, these little devices or instruments or whatever that are all over um, and deployed throughout your environment. Um, and what are these things? I like to put them in three categories, or really there's two categories. but. Um, there are consumer home devices, which you probably are all familiar with. There's Kickstarter gadgets. If you've seen Kickstarter projects, about Kickstarter projects that, that hit this IoT space. Um, and then there's industry-specific devices, which is, I think, what most of the people in this room are concerned with. Um, and we'll talk about how those relate and what we can use, how we, how we can use those things. Um, but where are we today with the Internet of Things? Um, this is a little hard to see, but I'm going to show you what the what the pointer. This is this is the uh, the Gartner um, the, the Gartner hype cycle. And if it, has anybody seen this before? But what this is is this is Gartner has a it's not scientific, but what they say is each technology that comes out goes through a, a life cycle of an innovation trigger or something that some technological breakthrough that comes out that says, hey, this is possible. Um, and then there's this peak of inflated expectations, which is all of these cool ideas come up that we can do all this sweet stuff with this new technology. And then once that peak happens, we fall down into what they like to call the trough of disillusionment, which is a little, <laughs> it's not as bad as it seems, but there's this lull where you come off this peak and you go, oh, that stuff didn't really work as I planned. And then we go into the slope of enlightenment which is where we like to start saying, we, we kind of get our grounding and we say, well, all that stuff didn't work, but we can figure out what we can do with this. And then the plateau of productivity, which is out and beyond, where this is major mass market consumer devices, industrial devices, and it's just a repeatable known thing. Um, let me rotate this a little bit. So what, where we are with Internet of Things, this chart here is um, actually about a year old now. They, this, is, this was published in July of 2015. They haven't published their updated chart yet this, this year. But Internet of Things, you can barely see it. It's up at the top here, right last year, a year ago, right at the peak of inflated expectations. Okay? And you can tell that because when you look at Kickstarter, if anybody opens Kickstarter or Indiegogo or any of these, these crowdfunded sites, it's full of devices that are on this Internet of Things category. People have these great ideas. Unfortunately, a lot of them are going to fail, and we're going to fall into this trough of disillusionment. Now, most people right now, if you um, think that the Internet of Things is actually on the downslide right here, because a lot of these Kickstarter projects are failing. They are um, failing to deliver, delivering late, delivering way over budget, all of the things that that consumer devices have a problem with when, when software developers think that we can make hardware. Okay. But what I'd like to see when we get out of this talk is hopefully you can see past this trough onto how you can apply this to your business goals, which I think is the more important thing here. So um, just to give you a quick overview of some of the consumer devices, you probably recognize some or all of these, and the people in this room might even have some of these uh, in your home. Uh, light bulbs like the Philips Hue light bulb, that's that's an Internet of Things device. It's a light bulb that you 
Everybody knows what a light bulb is, but it's smart. It's connected, and you can get data from it or control it in some way. Uh, smart thermostats like the Nest, the Ecovee 3, the Honeywell Link is also one of those. Smart locks like the August Smart Lock um, and the Quick Set solutions where you can control these locks. You can look on your phone and see, hey, if I, you know, is my front door locked or not, that sort of thing. And then even other stuff, sprinkler system controllers, weather stations, slow cookers, crock, official crockpots. You can check and see if your, your slow cooker is cooking while you're at work and the temperature and all that stuff. And there's, there's a million of these types of devices. Um, and this is your smart home. This is Internet of Things that targets your smart home. Key point I want to say here is that all of these devices have a business model and sometimes even an entire company, those are the Kickstarter companies, like, uh, like August, built around them. Uh, but this isn't what I want to necessarily talk about today. What I want to talk about today are the industry-specific devices that we will call Internet of Things that I think will help, that they're going to help the, your, your core business. Um, what we have to do is consider that all of these devices, all of these things, they already exist out there in your world somewhere. They, um, in some sort of dumb capacity. There is a device out there or a gadget or a widget that is operating and doing its day-to-day -day thing, and it has data in it that we like to call in the Internet of Things world, it's called trap data. It knows how fast it's spinning. If you think about some sort of a, a wheel on a truck, it, it knows what, how far open it is if it's a valve. It knows what temperature the room is if it's a thermostat. And that data, though, is trapped on that device. And when we want to talk about Internet of Things and making these devices smarter, we want to talk about freeing that data so that we can act on it and we can make smart business decisions based on that. I just have a, a list of some of those types of things out there, but it is really temperature pressure sensors, motion sensors. Uh, you want to know the location of a truck in the field, delivery truck or that kind of thing, or the part on an assembly line. Maybe to, you, know, you want to track something. Some of this stuff is done today, and we don't call it Internet of Things. Uh, charge level of a battery or maybe the health of a battery. Um, and really any data point that helps us make smarter decisions for our business. Um, a good, I, I think if you, if most people in this room, if you think about what your core business sector is, you could probably think of a couple of examples right now of something out there in the field or something in your office that if you knew more data about that thing, you could make a decision, a better business decision on it. Um, and I think the key point on all of these is that these things for a software developer, for the technical people in this room, for the engineers in this room, they are just our API bridge to the physical world, okay? Because right now as a software developer, I can make an API call to a database and tell me how many records are in that database. That's a really common thing for me to be able to do. I can say, how many customers do I have? How many of this? If I can also make an API call to the physical thing in the world and say, what's the temperature of that room? Is that door open? What's the pressure of this gas pipeline? I can make programmatic decisions. I can make really good business decisions based on those things as well. And that is where we make these, these devices very smart. Um, so the, the big theme of these things is generally they are low cost, single data point things. It's, a, it's one sensor or maybe a collection of sensors that do similar data um, that are deployed somewhere in the field. So one sensor reads temperature over and over and over and over again. It pumps it into my system. Maybe it reads temperature every five minutes. Maybe it reads temperature every second. Depends on what your business use is. I've got some pictures of some prototyping devices here. One of these is a Raspberry Pi, the other is an Arduino. Those are um, familiar to the people, and the technical people in this room, but what those are is those are devices that most of the time won't be deployed to the field, but those allow software developers like myself to prototype something, work on it on the bench, and quickly uh, prove something out and also develop against it while we're developing the core product. Um, so to reiterate, things are software developers API bridge. As a software developer, I can ask a thing about its world um, and, or a thing could tell me about its world. I can have a thing say, I can tell a thing, 
You know when the temperature in this room gets above 75 degrees? You need to tell me that this happened instead of me asking all the time. Um, or, more interestingly, as a developer, I can tell a thing to react to do something. So we'll get into some examples of that in our, in our, in our, uh, when I talk about what we did for our clients. But I can, I can tell a thing to make, maybe change the temperature set point or close a valve or change uh, HVAC, uh, close an HVAC vent, those types of things. And, and it, it all applies to whatever your business case is. is. Uh, so the key is there the, that we have data that's tracked and we need to free it off of our devices. Um, so now that we have, now, now we talk about data because it's really what these are. They're API, they're data. So when we think about deploying IoT, it's important to consider what, the, what value gathering all this data will provide to your business or your project. So you have to think about, is it helpful for you to know the tire pressure of every single truck out in your field? Probably not, but it might be. Think about it before you deploy a bunch of sensors everywhere. Is it helpful for you to know how many paper towels are left in the dispenser in the, in the restroom? Probably not, but if your business sector is to refill those paper towels, then it might be because we can do something with that data. We can, pro we can proactively react to it. We can do whatever, whatever, it takes, whatever we want to do there. Or how many times a clothing store rack has been spun. Or the temperature inside of a cooling unit. If you were in the refrigeration business and you want to react to some way to that cooling unit dropping down, these are very immediate reactions. But we can monitor those temp that temperature over time and maybe see a trend. Um, one key point I want to say here with all of this is, and this is going to where we're, we'll lead into Lonnie's talk later, but I'm going to use agile terms here, but let your product owners drive what data is important, just like any other feature in the application stack. So just like that product owner would say, I need to gather information from an end user, let them say, I want to gather information from this physical thing in the world. Okay? Don't, don't, don't say, hey, I can put a sensor on something, so I want to do it. Make sure there's a business case for it. And then with that tight collaboration, hopefully in an agile environment, let your engineers help those product owners understand what is possible. Product owners sometimes will say, I want to know how far away the moon is. We can measure that, but make sure that it makes sense. Um, okay. uh, other, other examples of these, this type of data, just to talk about <coughs> weather data is another really good example if you want to react to weather data. Now, we can do that in a couple of ways. We could do that with Internet of Things, with our own weather sensor if we need hyper-local weather data, or we could get it from other sources. And that's where that engineer helps out and says, is it worth putting a, a sensor out there to do that? In your opinion, mm -hmm. when do you differentiate or when do you decide to do an internal sensor, an Internet of Things approach versus an external sensor? So for like tire pressure, you could theoretically monitor the tires as they came by. I saw someone present us chickens the other day. Sure. Chickens don't <coughs> lend themselves to individual sensors, but overall, if you can use a camera to watch them, and pick out the chickens, it's less Internet of Things then and more blurring. Do you, did you have to worry about that? I think too? you're touching on a great point there, which is where is that line between Internet of Things and just sensors in the world? And it is very blurred. And a lot of the things I've mentioned here have been, we've been doing it for years with sensors in the world, talking about the sensors. That camera that counts chickens, that is a thing. Okay? It's reporting data back. Its data point is how many chickens can I see, assuming that's the, the data that's being collected there, right, versus putting a tag on every single chicken. Now, that, that is completely a case-by-case -case analysis of what's the feasibility and what's, what's it worth. How accurate do I need to be with this measurement? How real-time do I need to be with this measurement? You know, all of the, what, what can I achieve with that? And, and the tire pressure example is, I put that on there specifically because it is a good example of where you could go overboard with this. Hey, I can put a sensor on something. I need to do it. And we need to be really careful about gathering data that we don't need and or data that maybe will overwhelm us when we have all of this. What am I going to do with it? And so that kind of help. So great. We have all this data and now we're going to do with it. We, if you can imagine a K-12 
case where I've got a bunch of sensors in my physical world that are, maybe I've got 10 sensors in my, in my, in my office building that tell me information about the HVAC system, okay? That's not a lot of data. We can collect all that data, we can work with that data, but imagine a scenario where I've got thousands or tens of thousands of sensors out in the world pumping out data, little things. Let's just use the sense, let's just keep with the, the temperature example. If I have tens of thousands of sensors all over my, you know, international company all over the world pumping in all of this data, we are starting to get, we're not starting, we are in this, what, what the buzzword of big data territory. And I think that's the most important thing about Internet of Things is we can end up collecting a lot of data very quickly, and we need to consider a lot of things that you now consider because it's, it's data is data, and it's the same as if a end user was entering this data by hand into an Excel spreadsheet every hour, or if the sensor is pumping it in. We end up with a lot. And so we need to consider what needs to be stored, what can be purged. Some, infer some data is only interesting for a certain amount of time or a very short period of time. Um, and this is where your data scientists, if you've got them on your team, if you're big enough for that, they jump in. They can do their trend analysis, they can work their models, they can, um, and they can really help understand what it all means. Big warning here, I think. Don't collect data you don't have a business case for. That goes back to that product owner piece, okay? Make sure that you've got a user story in the agile world or a or you know, a requirement that says we need to collect this type of data. Don't just start collecting tons and tons of data because if you put a temperature sensor out there that reads the temperature of this room every five seconds and just start it, it seems like a lot of a small amount of data, but you will end up with a huge graph of data that you have to work through. Um, so, and on the point of, of purging, some of this data is gonna be useful, and this is just kind of on the big data concept, for long strategic business planning. Think sales forecast, think purchasing, think maintenance of tools. So if, we, if we're measuring the, say, the PSI in a, in a gas line or something like that, and we see that it's dropping, we must have a leak somewhere, something like that, that's maintenance that maybe we can do something preventative instead of you know, having a catastrophic failure down the road. Some of that data is long term, some of it's very short term. Some of it is, I need to know if the temperature spikes, and then I'm going to act on it, and then we can delete that information. So really, really keep that in mind when we when we're talking about storing this data and keeping it in place. Um, I do want to put a, I put a slide up here. I do want to put a, a caveat on or something to consider. We do need to consider things about the data collection. First and foremost, you do want to have the conversation of who owns this data that we're collecting. And it depends on your business segment. But if you are deploying a device that's a retail customer selling device and it's collecting data, do you own that data or does that customer own that data? Did that customer submit or did that customer agree to submit that data back to you? You've probably all seen when you've installed Microsoft Office or OS X or OS X, like there's that checkbox that says submit anonymous data back to Microsoft so that they can do whatever measurements they want on it. I'm seeing smiles back there. I know that some of you always uncheck that. Same thing applies here. If you've got a device that you deploy to a customer, a paying customer, be aware that that isn't really your data unless they want to share it back to you. And then on that note, does the customer want that data themselves? So if it is a retail product, that data could be theirs. Do they want it? Do they want to be able to mine it? Do they want to be able to fix their data analysts on it? Or have you build a UI so that they can work through it? Um, and if it's your own device, internal, your truck, your tires, uh, that's really no problem. Um, security of that data, important. But what I will say is, and this is a, cap, this is a big but, but um, it's not really much different than anything else that we're dealing with today from a security standpoint. Use the standard practices of the web. Use, use PSL encryption, use SSL, use key signing, use whatever level you need to based on what that data is and how important that data is. Um, some of this data can get really personal and some of it cannot, depending on what you're, you're tracking. Um, and then 
whether it is personal data or not, this last point, the volume of the data that you're collecting with all of these devices can actually feel, it's a perception, but it can feel very intrusive to the people that are around those devices. Um, and because it's collected very passively and in, can be in mass amounts. Um, a good example of that to me actually is, and this is an Internet of Things thing that we've been doing for years is, you know, you've got all those, you've got ID badges on your car, on your magnetic ID, or not magnetic, RFID ID badges on your, to get into your office building, right? We track those. We, we have the ability technically to track where you are in a building. Do we do that? Mm. Is it worth it for the business to do that? And that's the same thing here. We collect that data passively and in a lot of it. Um, another note on the security side, these devices that you have out there, whether it's a sensor or a camera or whatever, we want to treat them like client devices just like we treat a mobile phone application or a web application, is that we never really want to trust them. They could be, they're unreliable, they can be compromised, they can be messed with, all that stuff. So we want to have all of the standard practices that we would put in place for a mobile phone application, for a web application, for a client desktop application, apply to these individual devices as well. I'm not going into total, the details about that, but just to know that that space applies directly to one of these devices. Can't really trust it, but we want to, you know, we want to trust it, but we just, it's, it's, once it's in somebody else's hands, it's, it's not ours to, to trust. Um, and then speaking to the unreliability of those devices too, they, they're going to come in and out. They're going to, so we want to be, um, not security so much as just consider about the fact that you're going to get blips likely of, of these devices as they check in, give you a bunch of readings, and then they check out again. Um, so we have data, we've collected data, we've had our data, data scientists have analyzed the data, we've got um, a model in place that tells us, hey, when I see this, these types of sensors move out of spec, I need to do something. Here's some examples of some things that we can do. This is no, by no means a comprehensive list, but this type of data can give us early warning signs of a park failure. Or maybe my chicken population, to use your example, has dropped. What does that mean and how are we going to react to it? So your engineers, your business experts will know based on the model, based on whatever expertise they've got, what that means. So in this case, maybe the engineers know that if the pressure reading on a, on a tank drops or gets out of spec, that they can repair it before the failure is catastrophic, okay? So if I think about, if I've got a bunch of fuel tanks deployed in the field around the world or around the country, if I can see these go out of spec and I can get a repair team out there before it gets really bad, save me a lot of money and a lot of legal headache and whatever that is. Um, so these early warning signs, you can see them. I can send a notification to somebody to go perform that action. Um, here's an example of this hyper-local uh, inventory system again where go refill the hand sanitizer on the third floor because the Internet of Things device, the tiny little sensor in there says, hey, it's out. Okay? And if that's your business model and your business model is to be really good at filling hand sanitizers, then, then we do that. Um, on the programmer side of things, where I, where I get excited is I can send a message to another smart thing to change the behavior. So maybe I detect that this pressure reading is out on this tank, and I can adjust something on that tank to, 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 to stave off that catastrophic failure until my repair team can get there. Maybe I'd make it so we don't fill the tank or overfill the tank, or maybe I, wh whatever that is, maybe I shut that tank off completely, I turn a valve and that tank is now taken out of the loop. Right? So I can send another a message to a different smart thing, and we'll call that thing the valve in this case. Um, and then on the business side, so this is all saving you money. On the business side, we can recommend services or features to our customers' product based on the behavior of that in the field. And I want to emphasize the difference here in behavior versus the intended use. What we're going to learn when we put Internet of Things sensors out on all of these devices and things in the industry is that products are not always used or uh, the same, how we intend them as we designed them and tested them, right? We know this, but what we can do is if we get this big data around this, we can start to see that it's being used differently. Maybe, when, maybe I'm monitoring a bank of batteries, 
And I see that most of my customers are recharging them when it's below 30 degrees. When I, when if I can just tell them, hey, get it, get get the temperature up before you charge these things, you're going to get a lot much better lifespan and performance out of the product. That's a value add. That's <coughs> maybe a feature or service that we can add on. That's also maybe something we can build into the product in the future, and then cycle that through to the product owner into the backlog, and the money will cover that. So. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, so behavior, very important, we can see that. All right, so real world example. The real world example here is, this is what we did at Intertech, or what I did at Intertech, was we had a client that, they're, they're an electrical client, they charge batteries. That's one of the main products they have. They, they have a big, big battery chargers for big industrial batteries like golf carts, forklifts, floor sweepers, think warehouse things that are all battery operated. Okay, and most of these things, the golf cart's an exception, but forklifts and floor sweepers, their charging unit and their battery are all one module. They're together. So what we have here is they had a bunch of trapped data all over the country. And that data is every single battery charger knows the battery that it's attached to very intimately. It knows how it's taking a charge. It knows how it's decharging, its usage cycle, how many times has it been depleted this week, this month, all of that stuff. And uh, each charger also provides a very specific charging profile to a given charger. Now, traditionally, that's based on age. So in the industry, traditionally, what they do is, is when your battery is two years old, switch to this battery profile because we'll charge it a little bit differently as it ages through its life cycle. Three years old, four years old. And our engineers have, get, have guessed that if your battery is following the normal curve, it's that, that's how we can optimize its life cycle. Um, but we know that individual batteries are super expensive to replace. And you've all probably bought a new car battery. Think of much larger scale. Um, and so if we can even increase their life cycle by 10%, 20%, it makes a big difference on these warehouses that have hundreds of them. Uh, golf carts are a great example, or a good thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that example mostly as part of this um, because that has a, a couple interesting caveats on it. Um, so what we did here is, in our solution, our first step was to free this data. We have chargers everywhere. Each battery charger was equipped with a Bluetooth low energy wireless module. Okay, This thing allowed us to talk to the battery charger. Um, we, in Intertech, we created a uh, iOS and Android application using Cordova, which is the uh, cross, cross-platform JavaScript stack. So uh, we wrote it once in JavaScript, and it deployed to both. Um, that talked to those battery chargers. It connected via Bluetooth low energy. So walking into a golf cart barn with all of these golf carts and all these chargers, the person would pull up their phone app, and they could connect to any of these chargers and get information based on them. And they could also control those chargers. So you can say, okay, this cart's hooked up, start the charging, start the recharge cycle, and a couple other things that you can do to maintain the battery, um, and as well as get all the information around the battery. Um, and then what we did here was uh, we used a, a, the phone's internet connection as our, as our wireless bridge for these devices. I want to touch on that. When we talk about all these devices, we put a sensor on them. We still need to get them talking up, talking to the internet somehow. And most of the time, you'll see Wi-Fi devices. You'll see Bluetooth devices. And sometimes, if you're way out in the field, if you've got pipelines or gas pipelines and things, those devices a lot of times will have an actual of a, a cellular radio in them. Okay. You can imagine the price per device goes up as you as you work up how restrictive your connectivity is. We used the inter phone's internet connection because these are Bluetooth devices and they can't get to the internet by themselves. So we hopped through the phone. Um, every time that the phone talked to one of these, it would pull the charge history data off of this charger, send it to the cloud. Send it, we use Microsoft Azure cloud infrastructure for this, but uh, we could send it to any cloud infrastructure. As you can imagine, you can send it to your own on-premise infrastructure, however you want to get there. Um, and we did this every single time they connected. So. Somebody would walk into the cart barn and they would connect and then it would, it would uh, pipe it up there. Um, and then as you can imagine, without getting into too much detail, that charging information, that charging history of a given individual battery gives an electrical engineer a whole lot of insight on that one battery. 
it's the life of it, it's health of it, and everything. So we allowed them to act on that data then. And that is where the turnaround was. We gathered the data, and that's such a simple piece compared. But they wanted to act on that data. Um, and what we did was a couple of, couple of things that they wanted to act on. The first one, and this is an issue that they had with their fleets of golf carts, is um, they wanted to make sure that each battery was in the correct rotation because in a golf cart scenario, you, you, they, at the end of the day, all the guys pull the golf carts into the cart barn and they all park them in that first row and they plug them in. They're supposed to then, the next day, grab the carts from the way back and pull them back out so that the batteries get evenly used. They don't. The next day they come in, they pull them from the first row and they put them back and then they put them in the first row and, they, and those first 15 carts get used over and over and over again and the ones in the back didn't. This allowed us to see that, and it's allowed the client to see that, and the client, client, which is the golf course, to see that and say, hey, these batteries in the back row are never getting cycled, and that's incredibly bad for these batteries. They need to be cycled because these are lead acid batteries. Um, so this allowed that, that action to happen very quickly and very easily. Um, another thing that we solve in this charge cycle, and this is where the electrical engineers like it, is they can see early warning signs of when a, a cell, an individual component of those batteries is going bad, and then they can contact the client and let them know about that, the client can see that, and then um, that adds value to their product and offering, and service offering right there. There's money that the sales guy can say, hey, we can, we can proactively see this happening and at a large scale when you have multiple golf courses with hundreds of carts or multiple warehouses with hundreds of forces. Um, and then, and this actually applies to both, we can switch these aging batteries to the correct profile to increase their lifespan specifically to each battery. So instead of saying, well, it's two years old, it must be at this point in its life cycle, we can actually see that battery is in, the, is in this point, we're gonna put it on this profile. Or maybe it's the two year happy pass profile, maybe it's the two year we're trying to recover profile. There's a bunch of different profiles we can put on there. And we can put it on, when we see a bad cell, we can say, hey, this battery's got a bad cell, we're gonna, we're gonna switch the profile here to get as much out of it as we can until you replace it. Um, so, question, in this yeah. example, do you guys use the point-to-point, -point, like phone to the device, or do you actually pack a data to a central hub somewhere? This, this example, during the, this is the customer's requirement, phone to the charger, okay? Point-to-point. So Point-to-point, point, yep, yep, Bluetooth low energy, yep. Um, so in this case, they actually connect to each device that the phone can roll through in. Do that all the devices. But you use Bluetooth, so obviously you have been certain range. Yes. So they walk into the cart barn, and the reason we did that was a couple reasons. Um, one, the customer uh, that is the electrical engineering customer, very good at Bluetooth hardware. So they already knew that they know how to apply it, so it was very easy for them to add that hardware to their chargers. Uh, the second point was, m in their experience, most of these cart barns, in 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 their customers at least. They are so far outside the clubhouse's Wi-Fi range that there's no data connectivity there. So we needed to just we needed to use that phone as a bridge. And same with a lot of the warehouses. When you get into these big warehouses, there's no data connectivity inside the warehouses with metal shelves everywhere and stuff. You got to be right there with the device. Yep. But you could imagine a scenario where there would be a centralized thing that lives in that warehouse that talks to everything as it pulls in, or talks in the cart barn and talks to everything as it pulls in. And that would be the same model. Just a little bit different deployment. Yep. Um, and then what we got out of this whole project was this allowed the electrical engineers to see real world sample data from the profiles that they were developing and adjust them as they see fit, which is really exciting to see. This is more on the tech nerd side, but they were able to see these profiles that they were developing and testing in the lab and working the mathematical formulas out on. They can see that and say, wow, I've got 10,000 batteries out there and here's how they're actually acting. There's the big data, there's the, there's the data scientists coming in, and they can, they can adjust their profiles and really fine tune them and really make them good, um, which is another big value add for the client. Um, so in the end, with this project, we were able to turn dumb battery chargers that are not able to communicate with their, can communicate their local data, it was trapped on those things, um, into IoT smart internet devices. Uh, we used the cell phone as the data bridge that allowed us to get the connectivity to places that were hard to reach. Um, you know, like I said, those cart barns, uh, there was just no connectivity out there. So cell phone is a cheap way to do it. And also part of their research was, the reason we did that was the guy who, the, the guy, man or woman that was 
responsible for parking the carts, they always they would just download the app on their phone and then they would have it and we would use their data plan and they were cool with that because it's just a little little blip. Um, enabled the visibility and the battery charging all over the world and in all of this different situations and it gave those electrical engineers this awesome view of this data that they never never had had before. And that's where that product owner can say, we see this trap data out there. We want to be able to get a hold of it. Um, and in the end, this solution was very simple. And I say that from an implementation standpoint, but I say that from just the stack. Very simple. The data collection was very targeted with a very specific goal. It wasn't a, we want to collect all the information from all of our stuff everywhere. It was, we know what information we want from what devices where, and, and, it, and then we know the business value return from that. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to any questions, Q&A section here. Just a curiosity, how did you know which battery the charger was hooked to? Good question. So two ways. Uh, in a warehouse scenario, floor sweepers and, and forklifts and that, they're actually hard mated. Battery and the charger are mated together. Okay. Um, in the golf cart scenario, some of their carts, not all of them in, the, in this client, uh, but um, there was a data there was a data channel between that and the battery, and the battery would in, that battery would bring back its serial number, and so we had that. Um, in other cases, it was hand entered by that person. When they plugged the cart in, they would plug in they would type in there. I plugged in cart 47A, and we had that database to look that up. Yep, but excellent question. Oh, I have just a general question about databases in general. Do you see a move towards more unstructured databases with this? It, it depends. Right. Absolutely. Sometimes this data is unstructured because sometimes when I talk about an individual reading from a sensor, temperature 70 degrees, 70 degrees, 71 degrees, 72 degrees, 70 degrees, that can be unstructured, sure, but a lot of times that data still has some relational components to it. Where is that sensor? You know, what region is that sensor in? What is that sensor actually mean? All that stuff, that's, the, that's always the problem with unstructured data is you very quickly run into relational data and then we end up with a scenario where we're trying to cram relational data into these unstructured databases. So I don't think this, in my opinion, really changes that conversation. It just brings more data into the world and we need to be able to deal with it. And a lot of times we bring it into very structured uh, things, you know, cubes and stuff that are very structured so our, our data analysts can make models off of it. There's a paradigm too for like when this gets to be very heavy, when there's a lot of it. Right. I don't know they call it fog or mist or something where there are actually like local hubs that take it and put it back into a structured format uh, and pass it up. So. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't talk about the collection so much. It gets very technical. I didn't really want to dive into the technical implementations of it. But there are, you, a lot of times these devices report into a hub uh -huh. of some sort, and then that hub will shuttle the data to various places based on what that data is. It'll actually make a decision. So if that data is in some sort of alarm mode, it might go over here and here. If it's just in collection mode, it might go here. Strips and filters. Yes. Exactly, and those are generally you write SQL looking queries against that to build those filters. Uh, Azure and Amazon, it, and they all look very similar in the way they do pack. Um, when, when you're communicating with an IoT device, how does this um, 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 authenticate that it's being talked to by somebody that trusts? Yeah, so there's a couple models for that. Um, a lot of times, what we have done, so in, the, in my example, we knew it was a trust because we were there and we were on actually a lot. It's Bluetooth Low Energy, we had some key exchange. But a lot of times there's a pre-shared key that happens or maybe a pre-signed pre key. So when you deploy that device, it's shipping that key back with you, right? Um, or some pre-shared secret that those devices are, are known for. But most of the time we issue a key per device and then that key comes back with that. And so you use the asymmetric key model. Yep, um, that, and that is the way that the Microsoft Azure Hub is built. It's built around that. So the question on your analytics example to clarify the IoT concept. So in your in your example, would you consider the cell phone or the model that you use to be a part of the sensor? Because you need connectivity for it to be your IoT. Well, 
Yeah, so that gets into that those blurred lines a little bit, right? I mean, where I would draw the line, yeah, the, the cell phone in that thing is the bridge to the Internet, for sure. But the chargers are the sensors. They're storing their local charge data, and then we're freeing it with that bridge. Um, so without it, I wouldn't necessarily call it an IoT device. Um, I don't know. Maybe I would. It, it, There's a good, good example from yesterday that kind of syncs up with what you're doing here, which says that with, I think with the HTML5 spec, they can look at what your battery charge is, mm. and that can identify you within 1 in 14 million of phones. Oh, sure. So as a passive device that's just kind of giving data and people are reading, yeah, they can treat it like any other thing and say, look, I saw the battery on your phone. I can identify that by the charge on the battery if you go between two things. What I, would, what I would take away from this talk would be that the Internet of Things is certainly a buzzword. Um, try not to target the Internet of Things, but really look at all of the things we're capable of now and see if you've got data that's trapped in passive devices out there in the field that can help, make, help you make smart business decisions. And if you've got that data, let's figure out how to free it. Let's get it up into your, into your normal application, into your data structure, into your cloud, whatever you're doing, and then you can make great decisions based on it. I think that's the biggest thing. And I, I don't, if you want to call it Internet of Things, great. If you want to call it, that's just, I'm talking to a piece of hardware via an API endpoint, what, I don't, it doesn't. Cool. Uh, so we went over Internet of Things is all about <coughs> screening that trap data. I just kind of summed that up. Um, you know, I, I think the important thing here is you've got to really think about what data you care about. Leverage your product owners. Um, and start small. My recommendation, if you haven't done this, don't get lost in your data because you will be overwhelmed if you say, I want to read the, the, the temperature in these 50 locations every half second. You're going you're gonna to be overwhelmed by just the amount of data, the amount of scale that you need to store that, to receive that. All that stuff is going to crush down on your project when you don't need to do that. So, um, and be conscious of that data you're collecting. And just put that in the back of your mind because it, people get a little uneasy when you say to a truck driver, I'm going to track how many times you open the driver door of your truck for whatever reason. You know, maybe there's a business case for it, but be conscious of the, the, the humans that are around these devices as these devices are reading their world around them. Um, and then how will you act on the, the data to make smarter business decisions? That's, that's up to you, which is great. Um, and that's up to your product owners. So we figure out what we can collect, figure out what we're going to do with that data. Um, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll be around uh, if anybody wants to talk one-on-one, -on -one, any questions. And I think we're going to take a five-minute or so break, get refreshments, and do whatever. So thank you very much.